Today we are picking up with uh, Genesis chapter 9. We left off uh, with uh, Mo Noah, excuse me, uh, Noah and the flood. And so today we, we will be picking up with the end of the flood. And I want to read to you all uh, first, we're going to read verses 1 through 17, but I will read verses 1 through uh, 7 first, uh, and then we will read the second part a little later. So Genesis chapter 9 verses 1 through 7. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the terror of you shall be on every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish in the sea. Into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And surely I will require your life blood from every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Whoever sheds a man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it friends this is the word of god for the people of god thanks, thanks be, be to god. god heavenly father we do give you all thanks and praise for your word preserved for our lives uh, god i pray that as we uh, study your word and exposit these scriptures that we can uh, modify our sinful ways so that we can live in accordance to your will lord we pray all of this in and through Christ our Savior. Amen. So we just looked in verse in chapter 8. That was the story of the flood. And as I mentioned, if we grew up in the church, if we grew up as Christians, we have heard those stories, uh, the stories of Noah and the flood from uh, little children's church messages and Sunday school. And again, very often when that happens, when we become so familiar with a story, a Bible story, it can often lead us to a sense of apathy or, or a sense of, of, of not really understanding what that story means because we just know it. We know that the rains fell for 40 days and 40 nights, and we know that, Mo, or that Noah was on this ark with his family and all those animals two by two, and we know the story. But that's why it's so important for us to go back, look at the story, unpack it, walk by these passages verse by verse so that our minds can be transformed, renewed by the Holy Spirit. Because God doesn't waste words. Uh, God doesn't give us his scripture just so we can gloss over it. And so it, we know that God reset the world, if you will. Uh, and notice that's exactly what has happened with the flood. Uh, before the flood, you had Adam and Eve and uh, the family that they produced and the, the great multitudes that came from them. But after the flood, because of the wickedness that was in the world, God reset the pattern, if you will. And now every descendant finds uh, themselves coming from Noah, the man Noah, uh, who again, he and his children were preserved on the ark. So God resets the, the world, if you will, but notice what chapter 9 is telling us. Chapter 9, especially verses 1 through 7, is even though God reset the world, he did not reset the ethics, the mandate that he established in creation. So that's what God is doing here. There's a reason why Moses is going through and, and essentially repeating what God told Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 2. So this is the creation mandates, or what I call the creation ethics that God has established for us. Let me talk a little bit about ethics for a moment before we dive down. Some things that are, that are ethical are based on morality, right? We do things that are, uh, things that are ethics or the study of ethics study the things that are good and the things that are bad. Um, now, of course, we know that morality is defined by God. 
We don't get to define morality. That's not something we have the luxury or even the, the, uh, the call to do. And yet we, of course, see that happening in the world around us. Uh, different uh, uh, cultures, different societies, uh, different judges and different presidents may declare such and such thing as moral, but in fact it may not be moral. And Isaiah prophesied that. He predicted that uh, in the times there, uh, man will say that which is good is evil and that which is evil is good. We see a flip-flopping or a reversing of ethics and morality, and that's not a good thing. The Bible doesn't speak positively of that. Why? Because morality and ethics are defined by God. And so we see what God is doing here is God has reset the world. He, he, has, he has pushed the pause button, destroyed everything except for Noah and his family and all the animals that are on the ark. God is resetting the world, bringing it, if you will, back to the state roughly around uh, the Garden of Eden. But God is not resetting or changing the ethical mandates that he gave to Adam and Eve in the garden. This is how important God's commands are first to him and second to us. The, the fact that God is willing and needs to repeat what he established back in Genesis chapter 2 tells us that it's important for him and it's important for us. And so I want to take the time to unpack verses 1 through 7 here because we see that God is presenting to us, restating to us some of the ethics of, uh, the, the, that he has prepared in the previous uh, chapter of Genesis chapter 2. Now, I reviewed that and I talked about Genesis chapter 2 uh, and there are at least seven ethical principles there. In this instance, God repeats three of those seven. Uh, but I, I argue that uh, all of them are, are present and all of them are present in the rest of Genesis. But for our purpose, uh, God highlights only three here. So in verse 1, God blesses, says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, So God is speaking to Noah and his children, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So, of course, that sounds just like the mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 2. When God presents to Adam uh, the, the wife the, that he has created out of his own rib, bringing them together in this marriage that was made uh, in this wonderful temple uh, here on earth. And God presents them, says to them, be fruitful and multiply. So what does that tell us? That teaches us about God's design for marriage. God speaks very specifically about the ethics surrounding marriage and sexual relationship. God has reestablished, resets what it was once, that was once perverted back in Genesis chapter 4. Remember, we talked about that. Remember when we looked at the two lines that came from Adam, or well, and you know, Seth and Cain? Cain's lineage did nothing but wickedness, culminating, at least in the written record, with Lamech, who uh, perverted marriage by having two wives. You never see polygamy until Lamech. And so he has perverted, or we might say he has redefined marriage to suit his own morality. And of course, we know that that is bad because God here resets, restates, reestablishes his view of marriage. And the sanctity of marriage here is in the relationship between the man and the wife. God makes this covenant with only eight people, Noah and his wife, Noah's three sons, and their wives. There we see the covenant mandate, the ethical principle of what marriage is to look like. It is one man and one woman. We see here that marriage then is a divine institution. God reestablishes it because it is his design. It is his plan. 
We saw that God was doing that in Genesis chapters 2, where God put Adam and Eve together and wedded them. You know, we, we talked about the end of Genesis uh, chapter 2, where uh, Moses uh, seems to talk about, uh, uh, goes off on a, on a side tangent and, and narrates for a moment, Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So there we see that Moses is, again, sort of narrating for us the cultural mandate, the ethical uh, principle that God established in Genesis chapter 2, and it is being repeated here. Be fruitful and multiply. So if marriage was not a divine institution, if marriage was something that we could redefine and, and change however we want because it was just a cultural thing, then God would never have reestablished it after the flood. He would have said, go on, I don't care. Do what you want. But he didn't. He reestablishes for us the ethical principle of what marriage is to look like. And so marriage then is a divine relationship. It's a divine relationship relationship. It's a relationship that was created by the divine. God established it. God ordains it. God defines it. But it's also a godly relationship. It's a relationship that is to be modeled after the principles that God has set forth. It's a good thing. Marriage is a good for us. Now, of course, we live in a fallen world. We don't live in a perfect world, which means we don't have perfect marriages. We have uh, uh, parents who, uh, who do not love their children. We have husbands and wives who do not love one another. We know that our marriage relationships are broken, but we also know that God has given to us an ethical principle, and we must strive to live that way. If we know someone who is struggling in a marriage relationship that is broken, that is imperfect, that is abusive, that is in error, it is our responsibility as brothers and sisters in the faith to bear one another's burdens. I think that's what Paul is getting at when he says that in Galatians chapter 6. We bear one another's burdens as brothers and sisters in Christ. So if we know a single parent who is struggling it should be our responsibility to help them, to mentor uh, their children, to help them meet needs that they may be struggling with. Because marriage is an institution that is defined by God. And when our marriages are broken, are hurting, it is the church who steps in and lends a hand. Because it is the church who is the means of grace, the means of God's answering prayers. I'll talk about that all the time. We also recognize here then that the sanctity of marriage, specifically the quote, be fruitful and multiply, shows to us that God has presented that marriage is the only acceptable relationship for sexual intercourse. Marriage is the only relationship in which sexual intercourse is to happen. That is designed by God. And it's designed by God when he says, be fruitful and multiply. And he says it to a pair of married persons. Four pairs of married persons. We recognize that God has a high view of marriage. Next, verses 2 and 4, 2 through 4. And the fear of you and the terror of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish in the sea. Into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its Life that is its blood. We see here that God is establishing for us the principle of the sanctity of property. Let's go back again to verse 2. 
And the fear of you and the terror of you shall be on everything. He lists the beasts of the earth, the birds of the sky, the creeping things on the ground, the fish of the sea, the, the, essentially the four corners of the earth, the four elements of the earth, uh, in air, sea, land, uh, and, uh, and creeping underground. We see that God is saying, into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. God is establishing for us the sanctity of property, the sanctity of ownership. Here's what I mean. Nature is given to man as property. It is given over to the human race as something with which we are to be stewards. God has given to us this, uh, uh, this planet, this earth, over which we are called to manage. Now notice what is going on here. God is the owner. God owns everything because he created everything. God is giving over, handing over to the human race, a stewardship of this created order. Meaning God wants us, one, to use this thing that he has given to us, but also to trust in his provision over what he has given to us. The animals and the plants are given over as food, as clothing, as manufacturing uh, uh, goods. Uh, this includes, of course, the, the use of, of fields and orchards, and uh, uh, etc. You, you can't just have a bunch of animals if you don't have a, a field. You can't have a bunch of plants if you don't have an orchard. We see that God is establishing for the human race the use of property, the use of these natural resources. And so property ownership, as we call it, really it should be property stewardship, is a divine uh, right. It's a divine establishment. It's a divine institution. We don't need to shy away from using the property that God has given to us. Now, we do need to be careful about abusing the property that God has given to us. Just like our marriage relationships can lead to abusive situations, so too our uh, property and our business can lead to abusive situations. God has very stern, strong words uh, against uh, uh, managers and business people who withhold uh, the, the rightful earnings of their employees. That's written in the commandment, both in the New and the Old Testament. God has very important words to say to the, the master and the slave, to the business owner and the, and the employee. If you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, you are brothers. You are siblings. You are not to lord over one or steal from the other. God has some very strong words. Why? Because property, ownership, stewardship, there I'd say economics is a divine institution defined and directed by God. Of course, we uh, can see in the world today that property ownership is sometimes looked down upon, that industry and productivity are frowned, that you don't have to be industrious, that putting your nose to the grindstone and, and, and putting the work that you have established, you don't need to do that. If, you're, if you don't like what your employer says, if you don't agree with your, what your employer is doing, if, if you, don't, you, you can make a scene and do whatever you want. That's what society says. We don't need to look far to see how many uh, businesses are struggling to find employees because there's a wrong understanding of employment, productivity, industry. And the reason why is because there is an absence of understanding the sanctity of property. God establishes, reestablishes the importance of that doctrine here in Genesis. Verses 5 through 7. And surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. From every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. 
And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply it. Here what we see is the restatement of God's sanctity of life. Life is very important to God. If God didn't care about life, well, one, he would never have said this, and two, he would never have let Noah and his children repopulate the earth. God would never have saved all those animals two by two onto that ark if God did not care about life. God does care about life. God cares intimately about life that he speaks on two ends, if you will. Here we see verses 5 and 6 that God says that life is so important that if a life is unjustly taken, i.e. murder, killing, if a life is unjustly taken, I, God, demands that that life be repaid, if you will. That that life be recompensed. Some say, and I heard it today, I've heard it today, and I've certainly heard it in our own denomination, that there's an outcry against the death penalty. Why is that? God clearly establishes it here. God repeats it in the New Testament when through uh, the Apostle Peter, God tells us that the reason that authorities, that is the government, has the power they have is the power of the sword, which is the power to wage war and the power to punish wrongdoing. And yet, why do we think that the death penalty is unrighteous? Now, can it be unjust? Yes, it can. And God is fully aware of that. God is fully aware that the laws that he establishes, that, that the laws that people put in place can and have been abused. For instance, King David, beloved <coughs> King David, the, the, the most righteous king of Israel. What did he do? Well, not only did he have an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, he had her husband killed. He, as the king, certainly had the rights given by God, the divine right to wage war with others, which is what he was doing. He, certainly as the king, the commander-in-chief, had the right to send Uriah to the front line. But notice the motivation. The motivation was to get rid of him. And that is what Nathan says was wrong. And he repents, thankfully. But he was in a grave error for misusing the authority that God had given to him as king. That's a biblical example. Of course, we don't have to look very far to see examples in our own times and in other parts of story, history, and scripture. We know that power can and is abused. That life is often misused. That life is thrown to the wayside for comfort, for ease, for greed, for more power. Well, God will judge those who look at life in such a dark manner. But we see that God is establishing here the importance of human life. If you take a life, it is owed to God. And he establishes in the law what that looks like. But not only on that end, on the other end, so that's the death end, verse 7, we see the life end, the new life end. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. There again, he's repeating the creation mandate to go and be fruitful, the fruitfulness, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. So if God says this, to be fruitful and multiply, you better believe that God cherishes the life that is in that womb. The murder of babies on the altar of convenience is a mass sin against God. And you better believe that the judgment that is upon this nation 
is because in part of the millions of babies who are dead before the feet of God. God cares about life, all life. He establishes it here in Genesis chapter 2, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, in every book of the Bible, God cares about human life. The sanctity of life is so high up in God's heart that he puts forward for us the codes and prescriptions that are required of us. Let me read verses 8 through 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you and of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. I'm going to stop there. What God has now established for us in restating the covenant ethics in verses 1 through 7, God is now establishing the covenant seal, the visual sign, if you will, of the promise of this relationship that he has established. And God, let me back up and just say, God has every right to do that. We can't look to God and say, God, why do you set all these rules? Why do you care? Why do you establish these things? Well, of course, we can do that, and God will look at us and laugh as he looks upon the, in Psalm chapter uh, 2, looks upon the mighty who wage war, raise their fists at him. He laughs at the kings. God laughs at us when we try to raise our fists at him and say, God, why do you want to do all this? The reason why is because he's a creator. He has every right to do it. He is the one who brought you into existence. He is the one who brought this terrestrial ball into existence. He has every right to tell us how he wants it to be run. And as a sign of that covenant seal, he places, as we'll see, in the heavens the rainbow. But I'll get to that in a second. Notice here what God doesn't do. Verse 11, And I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God doesn't say he's never going to destroy the earth. God doesn't say he will never punish wrongdoing. God doesn't say that we have a license to do whatever we want. God simply says, I will not destroy by water. And we talked a little bit about that. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about the imagery of the flood as baptismal waters. In baptism, baptism is a sign of new life, of dying to the old self, but rising into new life, into a new creation. And so God will not destroy the earth with water, which is the sign of new life. Rather, as we know from Revelation, God will destroy the earth with fire. And fire is a more cleansing, a more purifying element, which I'm sure we'll discuss at a future point. Water will no longer be used to cleanse the sins of the people. Only the blood of Christ will be used to cleanse the sins of the people. And so again, water baptism is that sign of the cleansing of our sins by the blood of Christ. In verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. 
And it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. We talked a little bit about uh, back, I guess, back when we looked at chapter 8, uh, where God remembered Noah out on the sea. And I talked about that God didn't forget about them. Perhaps from Noah's perspective, God forgot about them. Moses is writing in human terms so that we can understand God. He's doing something similar here. It's not that God forgets his covenant and needs reminders every time. So, you know, oh, oh, there's a grain cloud. Oh, I'm not supposed to destroy people. Let me, let me not do that. God doesn't work that way because God doesn't forget. What God is saying for us is establishing in the sky with that rainbow the promise that God will never destroy flesh with water. Rather, God will redeem by the waters of baptism. And when we look at when he looks upon it, he sees this sign that he's placed in the sky. And I was curious, because Moses does repeat it a couple times here, that God says, I will see it and I will, I will remember the, that I have established this covenant. And it got me thinking. Remember what led to the flood in the first place? It was the violence that was upon the whole earth. Indeed, God is, that's what God tells Noah. That all flesh, the intent of man's heart is wicked from his youth. That's what God says to Noah. The intent of man's heart is wicked from his youth. And so, in a sense, it, it is almost as if God is saying, whenever he puts that rainbow in the cloud, in the sky, saying, I look upon this terrestrial globe, this planet whirling in the sky, and I see nothing but iniquity. We don't like the idea of God is mad and people are bad. Well, that's the story of the scriptures. God is mad. Because people are bad. But God is also gracious. When God looks upon this earth and sees the wickedness that we do, the wickedness that each of us commits in our own hearts, because you know it's true and you know it's there, the wickedness that our nation does, the wickedness that all the nations do against God, God as a creator has every right to get rid of it all. But he doesn't. Because he is steadfast to his promise. He is true to his word. And so God doesn't destroy us. Instead, what God will do is he will send a redeemer. This is what this covenant promise is pointing us to. It's as if when God says, I put this rainbow in the sky and I look upon the wickedness that's in the world, and it reminds me to stay my hand. Why? Because I am sending a Redeemer who will cover the sins of my people. I am sending one on which my wrath will be poured out. I am sending one on which will be a propitiation for all of their sins. And my anger will no longer be against them for it will be on my own son. That day will come. That day is promised. And of course, we look back and we say, that day has come. Thanks be to God that Christ went to that cross to take the fullness of God's wrath, which, which he held back with the sign of the rainbow, trusting that he will indeed Save those who are covered by the righteousness of Christ. I pray that we recognize that we are 
covered by that righteousness. And in that righteousness, we ought to do what is pleasing to God. I'm going to end here, but I'm going to say next week, we're going to be, it's Reformation Sunday, and I'm going to shift gears. We're not going to talk about Genesis. We're going to talk about Galatians. And we're going to see what Paul talks about in living in this life of the Spirit, this new life that God has given to us in Christ. What does it mean to not live in the flesh, but to live in the Spirit? That'll be next week. Until then, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you all thanks and praise for, first of all, your redemptive grace that we have seen witnessed in the life of Noah and his family. Lord, you did not have to save them, but you did. Likewise, you do not have to save any of us in this room, but you have. And so, God, we look upon your grace with awe and gratitude, knowing that we just love you because you first loved us. Likewise, Lord, as new creations, as uh, regenerated persons who live in the spirit and not in the flesh, we learn that we must trust you, that we must live as you command us to live. And Lord, I pray that you move our hearts where there is error or sin, where we wish to raise a fist against you. God, I pray that you teach us that it's not something that's wrong with you or what's wrong with your scripture, but something that's wrong in our hearts. And thanks be to God, our hearts can be changed. So I pray that your Holy Spirit renew us, transform us, take away our desire of sin, and replace it with a desire to do what is pleasing to you. We pray all of this in and through Christ our Savior. Amen.